Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us today and for presenting. Feel free to begin. Thank you for your introduction, Sharuti. And I would also like to thank Sovereign Health for giving me this opportunity. And I would like to welcome all of you who are attending today's webinar and all of you who may be joining to listen to the replay. I'm going to do a quick review of what we're going to be covering today. We're going to review the characteristics of a healthy family. We're going to review the characteristics of a family with addiction. We're going to talk a little bit about family systems therapy. We're going to identify and review the roles played in the families that contain addiction. We're going to identify effective strategies that you can use when working with families that contain addiction. And we're also going to have a question and answer period at the end, and I look forward to receiving your questions and, and answering as many as we can as time will allow. Now, one of the things that I'd like to say before we move forward with this is that there really isn't any such thing as a completely healthy family. So one of the things that I think would be helpful to keep in mind is that when we talk about healthy families or unhealthy families or families that contain addiction or anything like that, we're really in a certain sense talking about all families. We're talking about degree or extent of difficulties and challenges as opposed to the absolute presence or absence of them. So the characteristics of a healthy family are that the members of the household are committed to each other. And really what we're saying here is that the family operates as a unit. They consider each other as best as possible. And I guess as humanly as possible, they pay attention to the good of the family rather than only what might serve them. A healthy family also spends time together and I think one of the things that bears mentioning here is that it's not just a question of being in the same room or being in one another's presence. It's also quality time, which really goes into the next point of family enjoying open and frequent communication. And of course, obviously, frequent is a relative term, but what we're really talking about here is that the family has ongoing communication. And when things are not going well, they talk about it. But what tends to be more true in so-called healthy families versus unhealthy families is in, an un, in a healthy family, there's very little judgment. It's more having the perspective of, or the focus of, let's see what we can do about this, rather than blaming, shaming, or perhaps even contributing to someone feeling guilt. The healthy family turns towards one another during times of crisis. they have the opportunity to go to one another. It doesn't mean that they don't seek outside advice, they don't seek counseling, whatever, but the healthy family knows that when the need arises, the other family members will be there for them. Now, members of a healthy family also share a spiritual commitment. And basically what this means is much more of a leaning towards spirituality as opposed to pure religion. Now obviously religion does have, regardless of the religion, it, it does have a spiritual component. It has a belief in, let's say, a higher being, a creator, something greater than oneself. And the members of the healthy family actually share this in some way to some extent. And 
each person in this family trusts one another and they value and trust everything that they've accomplished and what each other has accomplished. So basically, the picture that's being painted of a healthy family is not one that is without challenges, not one that is without difficulties, but it's one that generally and in a sense can more easily resolve the challenges they're facing and come to a solution and or conclusion that is most beneficial to them. In an unhealthy family, the members of the household make choices that do not reinforce their family structure. It's really more like, what's in it for me? Um, how can I benefit? Even to the point where other family members are not even considered. So the outcome of behaviors or decisions on other family members is not even considered. An unhealthy family may also actually isolate from one another. They might spend much more time in activities that are more individual and do not either welcome and or encourage any sort of interaction. In these families, there is an absence of positive communication, which makes it really difficult for them to manage stressful situations effectively. So some examples that I've given of stressful situations might be financial issues, um, conflict resolution, and as all of you know, over time, when the stress builds up in an individual's life, beyond the point where it is manageable, it becomes distressful. And the coping strategies that people use, if plans are not made ahead of time for managing stressful situations, include substance abuse, having affairs, or even just in a certain sense leaving the family, just sort of living the life the way they want to live it. So one example might be it's supper time and instead of one or two of the family members sitting down for dinner, they just walk out. Or maybe they go to their room and when questioned about the dinner, they'll say, no, I'm not hungry. I don't, I don't, I don't have to eat right now. Another characteristic in this family, this type of family, is that the members tend to be disrespectful towards each other and they're not really there to help or support one another through challenging times. And obviously the primary reason why this happens is because the person or even many of the family members all at one time are so overly stressed that they are just barely having enough energy to take care of themselves much less take on whatever challenges or problems other family members might have. Also, when we talk about the spiritual aspect in these families, we find that generally in these families there's a lack of a sense of acceptance and or an understanding of the idea of a higher power, creator, um, God, or even just something greater than yourself. And I think one of the points that bears mentioning here is that besides having friends and besides having past experiences that have helped you to know that you can get through certain things, it really is very helpful 
to be able to accept the idea of something greater than yourself. Because by having that idea in your mind and having that attitude of acceptance, in a certain sense it kind of fits in with one of the 12-step comments of let go and let God. So when a person is feeling overwhelmed, the last thing they need is something else to have to manage. But when a person can have enough comfort to know that maybe they can put the situation on the side for a little bit. They don't have to keep thinking about it. They don't necessarily have to do anything about it. And that having faith that time can also help. You know, there's an expression, time heals all wounds. And there is truth to that. Now also, members of these households do not trust either themselves or each other. So without that trust, it's really difficult for people to follow what might actually be really good advice or good guidance. And unfortunately, what tends to happen in these families, as I going to pretty well guess that most of you know, is that wherever the problem starts, there's a downward spiral from that point forward. Now, it's not a straight line downward spiral. You know, there may be moments of plateauing. There may be moments of either improvement or what seems to be improvement. But overall, over time, there is a downward spiral, which of course just adds more and more distress to the family. And going along with this idea, members in this type of family unit feel constricted in their ability to make decisions and mistakes. So again, talking about the downward spiral, when the people are having difficulty making decisions, they're afraid to make mistakes, they're concerned about being judged, they're only going to do what has been working. They may not necessarily make the best decisions in the world in terms of what the best decision actually is, but they will be making the best decision that they can make at the time, which provides momentary relief, but unfortunately only exacerbates and complicates the situation even further. Now, one of the things that I want to mention is that I have found it to be counterproductive to think about people and to think about behaviors in terms of labels. I know it can be very helpful in certain situations, when I am counseling individuals and when I'm advising people, I have found that the more I tend to think in terms of labels, or let's put it another way, maybe the more I tend to overly focus on labels, the more judgmental I am, and it's not just because I'm using a label, my Labeling follows my thinking, and my thinking follows my labeling. So it becomes a cycle. So I label, and then I start thinking about all the things that that label means, and I actually start seeing that person from within that perspective, which limits my ability 
to be helpful because the more judgmental you are, the less open and the less flexible you can be in providing help to your clients unless you want to follow a very concrete linear approach that is kind of like a cookbook approach as opposed to bringing you into the process. And I'm just going to highlight this point with a brief story about my experience in graduate school. When I was going to graduate school to earn my educational specialist degree in marriage and family therapy, we were studying about the different, ther the different leaders in the marriage and family field. And I went up to the instructor one day, and my question was, who should I follow? Who's really the best person of all the leaders in the marriage and family field? Who should I follow, and, and who should I copy my approach after? And what the instructor said to me, was one of the most helpful comments and one of the most beneficial remarks that I have heard that has contributed to my professional development. And essentially what she said to me was, you don't follow anybody. You be who you are. And I said, but I don't understand. Like we're learning about all these theories of family therapy, what do you mean don't follow them? And she responded by saying, you learn what they teach, but you integrate it into your style of counseling. Admittedly, at that moment, I didn't have that much of an idea of what she was talking about. I mean, I understood it. I kind of went blank on, well, so how do you apply this? And what I realized was that that's not a question that could get an immediate answer other than the answer that I'd already received. And as time went on, what I came to recognize is that I had to develop my approach over time. I had to accept that I was not perfect, otherwise I'd be creating a lot of distress for myself. I had to be willing and open to learn from my mistakes and realize that they were learning points as opposed to anything being a negative reflection on me. So when we're talking about family therapy, we'll talk very briefly about family systems theory. And basically, it's a theory that was introduced by Dr. Murray Bowen that suggests that individuals cannot be understood in isolation from one another, but rather as a part of their family, as the family is an emotional unit. Families are structured around roles, rules, rituals, boundaries, and hierarchy that either contribute to or take away from the well-being and the happiness of each family member. I think one of the most important points that I would like to tell you about that's related to this slide is so much of what you see so much of what you hear is based on how you interpret it. It's based on what you think about it and the way you think can also have a profound effect on the outcome of any counseling that you provide to your clients.
And I'm going to say more about that towards the end of this webinar when we, we talk about effective strategies that you can use. But I think for now what's important to remember is that sometimes things do not seem the way they are. They can actually be very different from what your perception is telling you. And I'll give you a brief example of how this happens. I remember I attended a lecture one time and it was on perception and it was on prejudice and stereotyping and the presenter held up a piece of paper in front of the room and there was all blue in front of the paper and the presenter said, so what do you see? What color do you see? And everyone in the room basically said blue. And I said, well, I wasn't actually the presenter. I just made myself the presenter. Anyway, the presenter said, well, what if I told you I see white? And of course, people started looking. And they literally scratched their heads. And what the presenter did was they turned the paper over and they saw that it was a blank sheet of paper that was all white. And the whole point of that exercise was to demonstrate how different people can be looking at seemingly the same thing and actually have a whole different perspective on what they're seeing. We're going to talk about family roles now. The so-called addict, the person who has the addiction, all of the family's activities revolve around or in reaction to this person who at some point will experience guilt, shame, and low self-esteem. And one of the points that I think is extremely important to insert at this moment is that just as I spoke about labeling and the downside of labeling, what I'm intending for you to get from this part of today's presentation is a way to think about how family members in these families behave. It's not to pigeonhole them. It's not to use judgment against them. It's with the understanding that people don't get up one day and say, wow, you know what, I think today I'll be an enabler. Or I think, you know what, I think what this family needs is a hero. When we're talking about family roles, we're talking about an individual family member's attempt to be able to adjust as best as possible to the behavior of the person who is abusing alcohol or using drugs. Now, the enabler or the caretaker is typically the spouse or the partner who, in a sense, and again, this is not with intention, in a sense makes it easier for the person to keep using and tends to experience underlying feelings of inadequacy, fear, and helplessness. So even though each of the family members take on a specific role, for the most part, if not completely, unconsciously, it's not with conscious intention, they still experience difficult and challenging emotions, which, as you all can well imagine, contributes more to the distress of the family because if you'll recall, one of the things I mentioned a few minutes ago is that they don't go to each other for help. In a sense, they take out their challenges on each other rather than having the capacity and perhaps even temporarily not having the ability to know how to speak in a reasonable way to have the confidence even to go to other family members to seek the help that they need. Now the hero is usually the oldest child 
and the person who assumes this role can also be considered one of, if not the only, overachiever or a person who's overly responsible. This person is the so-called pride of the family. They tend to experience underlying feelings of fear, guilt, and shame. And one of the things that I think that would be important to mention before we continue on reviewing the family roles in the family is that these feelings are not exactly directly related to the roles that are being played, but they are a consequence not only of all the distress that's going on in the family, but also the recognition, at least on some level, that despite their greatest efforts, it doesn't seem to be working. The problem either remains and or gets worse. And of course, the feelings of, of self-esteem, feelings of powerlessness, all of these feelings continue to kind of come up and go away. They increase and they decrease. But it kind of has all the family members off-center. And if you think of, about a family in terms of a mobile, you know that as one part of the mobile goes, mobile goes up, the other part goes down. That's a, a really good metaphor for how individual family members affect one another. When one is up, and I mean that in a positive way, when one is managing their stress a bit more effectively than usual, another family member might go down. The scapegoat is the child who's the troublemaker. The behavior actually takes attention away from the real problem and it also takes away from other family members' problems and this individual usually tends to experience underlying feelings of guilt and shame. The mascot is typically the youngest and that person's role is kind of to be the jester. That individual brings humor and amusement to the family, takes attention away from the problem, even if it's just momentarily. And that person also tends to experience underlying feelings of embarrassment, shame, and anger. Now the last family role that we're going to review today is the lost child. The lost child is the quiet one in the family. This individual is quiet literally most of the time, tends to be reserved, will do everything possible to avoid negative conversation, and this person can get lost for hours just doing whatever they do, whether it's going to their room, going outside, and this individual tends to experience underlying feelings of guilt, loneliness, neglect, and anger. So far, we've been talking about what could be considered an awful lot to manage. But one of the things that I would like to say as a lead-in to the final part of today's presentation about effective strategies that you can use is it is not your responsibility to make any of your clients change. It is your responsibility to do whatever you can possibly do to keep them safe. But it is not your responsibility to make them do anything. When I was a clinical supervisor in an outpatient drug and alcohol program, one of the clinicians that I was supervising was very, very frustrated 
when she was with me one day in one of our supervision sessions. And basically, she literally said, I can't make this person stop using. And when I helped her to understand and at least consider the possibility that it was not up to her to make the person stop, the counseling became much more flowing. The client became much more accepting of the need to not only abstain from use, but also to be in recovery. And the primary reason that this shift occurred is that the power struggle of that interaction was dramatically reduced and the client was given the opportunity to consider what he or she truly wanted to do and was not going to do it just to keep the counselor happy. So in terms of effective treatment strategies, I'm going to go through the list and then I'm going to give a few closing comments and then we're going to open up for questions and answers. Obviously, one of the most important things is to perform a comprehensive assessment. And, okay, I said I wasn't going to go over each one. I'm going to go through them real quick and then I'll run through in a more general way. I think that might be more meaningful for you. Identify the client support system, including family members and their roles. Include family members in treatment as best as possible. Determine clients' goals and motivations. Encourage and allow the client to contribute. And I'll put contribute in real bold letters. Contribute to the treatment plan. Educate family members and client and the client about family roles and observe the client's personality and style of relating to you and others. And by others, what I mean is the style of relating to each other or perhaps other staff members. So the overall view that I have found to be effective with the clients that I work with and that I have worked with, and that what I'm recommending that you consider if you have not been doing any of this, because I know that you've been doing at least some of this, is within the first one or two sessions at least, you can still be helpful, but get the most objective assessment of where the client and or family members are as is reasonably possible given the circumstances of the session that you're in. As you all know, so many people who struggle with alcohol abuse, drug abuse, they have plenty of shame. They have plenty of guilt. I really, really do not think that anyone ever, ever gets up one morning and says, you know what, I think today I'm going to be an alcoholic or I think today I'm going to be a drug addict. That doesn't happen. It's quite obvious that whatever decision a person makes, whatever choices a person makes that puts them on that road, that's not something that they want to do. You know, whether it starts out just as an experiment or if it starts out to cope with some sort of psychological challenge, with the challenge that's going on in the family, with, with self-esteem issues, whatever the reasons might be, no one really actively chooses this, this form of lifestyle. So when I say to determine as best as possible 
in the most objective way possible what the support system is, what the family members think about what's going on, what the client's goals are. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with clients who initially either did not want to stop using or were ambivalent about it. And because of the approach that I took, and this is my belief, it may not be accurate, but I believe that because of the approach that I took, it gave them the space to decide to stop. And I also believe that there is a possibility that by giving them the opportunity to choose what they wanted to do, they had more motivation to focus on recovery then if, in their mind, they may have thought that they were doing it because they had to or I was forcing them to. And I know there are certain situations, like especially when you're dealing with the justice system, with the courts, I know there are certain situations where it has to happen. And I mean, there are so many aspects of that to consider, which really go beyond the scope of today's presentation. So I want to make sure you have some time to answer questions some questions, I mean to ask some questions so I can answer them. So I'm going to stop here and I welcome any questions that you may have. Okay, Dr. Simba, can you say more about your statement where the problem starts? Yes, Victoria, and in a certain sense that's a question that has answers and doesn't have answers. But I'm going to tell you what my experience has shown me. The problem starts with the first use, or I said a different way, the problem can start with the first use because some people use very briefly and then they go away. But when there is a problem, it starts with the first use. And there's really two aspects to that. If the person uses something, whether it be drugs or alcohol, and there is no problem that they see that comes from that, that sets them up to continue to use. And if they use and they find that whatever is going on in their life gets relieved, that's the other place where the problem starts. And then, of course, as you know, it's just, it just kind of takes off from there. Sometimes it could become a big problem quickly, and sometimes it can take a while for it to develop. And I think the biggest issue is that as the problem either develops or just comes out of nowhere and there it is, the lack of awareness coupled with the relief that the person gets from the use really exacerbates the problem. I hope that answers your question. Okay, moving on to the next question uh, from Paula. Any suggestions regarding working with parents that have lost a child to addiction and is fearful of other children having the same fate, fearing that the behavior can change the cycle? Yes. So Victoria, my response to your question, and, and I want to say I want to comment on your question and, and other people, the first person, first attendees question that these are really, really good questions. That I think it's important to realize that even though in our training we are taught that addiction is a family problem and that addiction runs in families, I think one of the things that you can say to that couple is that it doesn't necessarily guarantee that everyone is going to have a problem. The thing to keep in mind is that in families that have a history of addiction, the likelihood is greater and the occurrence might be quicker for it to become a problem than in other families. And that you could provide strategies and guideposts or signals that you can alert them to to help them to recognize if there's a problem that is in the process of developing 
and also to encourage them that if they ever suspect that occurring, to contact a professional and get an assessment so they can know whether there really is a reason to be concerned or not. Because obviously in situations like that, there can be a tendency for family members and especially parents or caregivers to be overly sensitive to the idea. And as you all know, if you're overly sensitive to an idea, there's this thing called negative self-fulfilling prophecy, you could actually in some way not cause it, but contribute to it happening. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you so much Dr. Simba. Moving on to the next question from Genevieve. How does treatment change when working with an adolescent as, as, as addict? Well, one thing I would say, Genevieve, is when working with adolescents, that's extremely challenging. And the other thing to consider is the point at which whoever the clinician might be would be intervening. So, for example, when an adolescent first enters inpatient treatment, and let's say maybe detox is a necessary part of it, but it doesn't really matter. It's really important to keep in mind that I don't even lessen is at least moving towards recovery. And the effect that the alcohol and or drugs has on the adolescent's brain really makes it almost impossible for them to be reasonable enough at that stage of treatment to benefit from a lot of in-depth counseling, a lot of insight type of therapy. I think one of the most important types of interventions, and I'm not using that term in the typical sense, use in, in, during the counseling of that stage is acceptance, listening, understanding what the person is saying but not necessarily believing it because as we all know you know adolescents I guess just like everybody else tend to kind of slant the way they're seeing things based on their experience and also based on how their brains are working as the treatment process progresses I think it's really important to get the caregivers involved in the counseling process, get them involved in the assessment process, but this is a delicate balancing act because depending on the age of the adolescent, there's that whole developmental stage of independence, dependence, and most likely there's been an awful lot of conflict and separation at this point. So another thing that you want to work on as calmly and, and patiently as possible is establishing more and more positive communication between the adolescent and the primary caregivers. And then of course as the adolescent indicates by behavior, by comments, that they are more and more open to being in recovery the more typical approaches would, would really be warranted and the most important thing is to do everything you can not to get involved in a power struggle. As long as the adolescent is safe, if you don't agree necessarily at one point, you don't necessarily have to get to some agreement or get the adolescent to agree at that moment. They need a chance to be able to feel some autonomy so they can accept what you say because remember one of the characteristics in that type of family is to depend only on yourself and of course you also have the peer group influence too and all that that's been going on. So I hope that that answers your question. Okay, thank you doctor. Moving on to the next question from Lauren. Could you go into more detail about the specific interventions you implement when working with the family in denial or resisting change? Yes. 
And that's a great question too, Lauren. In a sense, what I do in those situations is I employ the idea of motivational interviewing. I minimize telling and I maximize asking. So once I have what I might consider to be a reasonable amount of background information, I will ask questions that of course in and of themselves are actually statements with a question mark on the end, but my intention is to help the people to recognize what is going on. So for example, if someone says, I don't have a problem with alcohol, I will question them about their life experiences and I won't say it this way, but whatever kind of consequences they may have been experiencing. So I might ask about a DWI, I might ask about trouble with the law, um, if it's an adult I might ask some questions about getting along at work, getting along with employees, getting along with supervisors, and then once the client is able to say, yeah, you know, I have this problem, and of course you know they'll be minimizing and they'll be rationalizing and intellectualizing. I'll say, so what do you think is the reason for that? And what I have found is that when I engage in open-minded conversation with clients that are in denial, again, it's not everybody, it's not about being perfect, it's about reaching as many people as possible. But when I approach it in a more open-minded, questioning way, I find that people tend to be much more open to at least considering the idea that maybe there's a problem. Because one of my primary goals, especially in an outpatient setting, is for the person to keep coming back so that they have the best chance of having the best life possible and obviously also of not dying. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Doctor. And moving on to our last question for today. Uh, it's from Karen. How do you handle very concerned parents who mean well but who actually undermine professional treatment with their demeaning and enabling behaviors towards their addicted adolescents? Okay, again, a really, really good question. And Unfortunately, in a sense, it's a very common occurrence. My primary approach with those parents is to listen to their anger, give them a chance to express their concerns, give them a chance to express what their experience has been, and then educate in the most neutral way possible and not so much explaining it from within the perspective of what you do, meaning what the parents do, but talking about it from within the perspective of in families that have this type of experience and have this type of challenge and this is what goes on and I kind of incorporate what they've told me. What I have found generally doesn't work, despite the most positive intentions, is, and then I explain in the most general way possible how that type of behavior and that approach cannot be helpful and indirectly can actually contribute, not cause, but contribute to the problem. And then I help them to understand what the behaviors are all about and I give them strategies on how to manage their concerns in a way that can be most beneficial to anyone and I also help them to understand as best as possible that it's up to the person who's abusing the substances to really make the changes and no one can make them. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you Dr. Simberg. Really great answer, I must say, and very nice presentation. 
Okay. Um, uh, we have we are receiving lots of questions from the attendees, but keeping the time frame in mind, we have to end this session right here. Uh, whatever questions we are left with, we will respond all in all the people individually via email. Now, um, yeah. Thank you, attendees. Thank you for your participation, and thanks for joining us. If you have any further questions, please feel free to send them to webinar at solvehealth.com. And if you have any questions related to CE certificate, please send your queries at s.sharma1 at solvehealth.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a thank you email within 24 to 48 hours with all the information pertaining to this webinar and how you can earn your CE certificate. This presentation will be available to watch after 72 hours on solveinstitute.com. Now I'll tell you how you can earn your CE certificate. You will need to register yourself on solveinstitute.com and complete a short questionnaire and feedback form in order to generate your CE certificate. Please save in your login credentials for future use. You can access several other existing CE presentations as well. Answer the questions that follows and you can earn your CE certificate for those presentations as well. You can view our upcoming free CE events in future there as well. So you just need to sign up at solveinstitute.com. Thanks again for, for your participation. We hope you found this information valuable. Have a great rest of your week and we look forward to bring more interesting webinars each month. So keep joining us. Thanks and goodbye.